Welcome to the party. I'm not here right now, but I want you to listen very carefully. These guys are very funny, so pay attention. Enough talk. It's showtime. Hello and welcome to Bags of Action. My name's Steve. My co-host is Pete. Hello. This episode is a surprise because we didn't know what we're going to be recording. This is true. Not that long ago. So, surprise listeners, the the film we're talking about, except for those who are on the Facebook group, this is why you should go on there, you see. We're talking about Death Wish. This is the, of course, remake from 2018 starring Bruce Willis. And directed by Eli Roth, of all people, which is a surprise. So, this is Death Wish from 2018. So, before we talk about that, how aware were you of the original Death Wish films starring Is Nibs, Charles Bronson? Charles Bronson. Have you watched any of them? I definitely knew about them. I mean, culturally, they were a huge thing. Even though I'm a bit older than you, I still was a bit young, I think, when the first ones came out. 72. 74 was the first I was film. I was a I was born so I, I was didn't not. watch it I <laughs> didn't watch it immediately that wasn't I wasn't like uh, my mother didn't give birth in the cinema and I saw de- <laughs> the death first wish image burned out your retinas was Charles yeah, Bronson yeah. gunning someone down <laughs> but I think I think I've seen I may have seen the first one right. I think I've seen like the fourth one or something mm. I've seen bits and bobs but I was I was thinking of this when I was doing notes is that like the thing now, we've got this whole kind of this kind of film has come back into vogue in a way, but in a slightly different way. So, what you'll get now is people that used to be in the armed forces or a secret agent or an assassin, and they get dragged back into their old life yep. because something bad happens. But the bad thing that happens will be like a, a pet dies or a someone's kidnapped it doesn't tend to be as brutal as in these that is in the 70s stuff the 70s stuff was a lot more shocking and it tended to be families being murdered or sexually assaulted mm-hmm. and it the, what i would say is the heroes tend or anti-heroes i guess tended to be everyday people true they weren't somebody with a background in uh, of skills yeah Peter they were just somebody who, like, I don't know. Well, in the original version of this, actually, he was an architect. Yeah, um, which was really yeah. weird to find out. Yeah. So he could measure people. He could measure the exact angle to, <laughs> to hit you in the face. Yeah, so it was... Uh, so there, it tended to be... I mean, in a way, I think it is like a white-collar kind of vigilante fantasy, really, mm. is what these films were. And there were loads. And there were loads of copy... There were loads of... Uh, there's a film I remember... So I found uh, details I've called No Safe Haven, which I remember watching with my dad. Yeah. And I was uh, I was quite early in my teens. And he was like, and he just walked in. He went, oh, what's this? And then basically the people walked into a house and just brutally murdered the main character's mother by shooting her up against the fridge. And then it just got into the kind of revenge stuff. And there were so many films where the first 10 minutes were your mother, your wife, your daughter. It was always a female character being you know terribly treated and then the rest of the film is somebody learning how to handle guns and then going and getting their own back and it's interesting this this was written by joe carnahan who wrote the gray and the a-team and a film i absolutely love called narc have you ever seen narc i don't think maybe jason 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 patrick Uh, so because i guess it's a weird, it's an interesting thing because like, Eli Roth is known for the hostile films and he's kind of a Tarantino buddy and he's kind of more of a torture porn kind of guy, I guess. Yep. And so it was an interesting thing because I can get, I kind of look at it and go, Death Wish, it's kind of, it is exploitative and that makes sense of that kind of director. Carnahan is a, is a really established writer and it's a really good cast mm-hmm. for, the, for this kind of film. You know, it's Bruce Willis, admittedly, a lot of the films he does now, it was quite nice to see him with a film in a film with a decent budget and that was lit well, you know, and felt more like a, a, a bigger budget film than, than he's been in recently. Vincent D'Onofrio, who it's still hard to not see him as Kingpin. Yeah. Um, uh, Elizabeth Shue is still around. She's in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dean Norris from Breaking Bad, who's playing very much the type, really. 
as a police police guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He well, he's been in everything from Starship Troopers, you know, on on upwards. He's just been in, in films forever. But so you know, the, the original one was based upon a, a novel from yes. two years ago, which obviously I I didn't know either. <laughs> I didn't know the original one was directed. The first two films were directed by Michael Winner. Of Michael Winner, yeah, yeah, Michael Winner, yeah. So in the new one, they've kept the white, uh, blue collar, white collar kind of ordinary man thing, in, but instead of an architect, they kept the name as well. Yeah, they did. So the original character was Paul Kersey, and Bruce Willis is playing Paul Kersey, Paul Kersey. again. Although they've changed it a bit so that he's more upper class. In this, he's a surge. He's a Emergency room kind of not surgeon, kind of doctor uh, who stabilizes them long enough to be taken to the operating room. So he's very, very wealthy. He's often on call. His family are incredibly accommodating. What do they yep. call it? Trauma surgeon. There you go. That's it. Um, but did that, you see, the first thing, as soon as they mentioned he's a surgeon, and like up on the little corner of Netflix, it says graphic injury detail, mm-hmm. being at the top. I thought, oh, hang on a second. Is this basically, although it's Death Wish, yep. and he's got guns and what have you, is it going to be any, is it basically, because he's a surgeon, is he just, my thoughts at that point was he was just going to get the people that he's obviously going to be getting revenge on, and then just start, like, cutting them into pieces or... Yeah, form I did wonder. Because I thought, oh, is this kind of going to be an Eli Roth film dressed up as as Death Wish, really? Mm. Um yeah, but it, it it wasn't that. Thankfully, it was is closer to the original model of the original, the original film. I would say, um, obviously, by changing things up and making him wealthy. Um, I don't know. Architects have probably got a fair bit of money, haven't they? Yeah, well, some do. It depends what the what the thing is, but the mold is pretty similar mm. in that the wife and the daughter are attacked much harsher, as you said in the original. Yeah. compared to the 2018 version, and he then goes on revenge, trying to find the people. But he's, the, the weird thing is, it was, because Bruce Willis starts off as an ordinary guy, he's not a maniac with guns who knows everything. That was a different... I've got very mixed feelings about this film, so I kind of work yes. through them. <laughs> yes, so that so was I. different. So it was interesting to see Bruce Willis in a role where he wasn't immediately a badass and just went out and killed everyone. So that was interesting. He, as you said, a lot of the films he's had in the last few years have been kind of paint by numbers. We know from other people talking about him, he just kind of walks through them half asleep some of the time. He did actually do some acting in this one, which was nice. He did some good acting, I thought. Yeah. yeah so after his wife dies, uh, we are obviously going to spoil the film, and, do, his, yeah, and his and his and his um, daughter's in hospital and stuff. It was interesting because there's an element of me goes, yes, this is an everyman who can't use guns, but yeah. it's also Bruce Willis. So it's hard to kind of, even in other roles, it's hard to disconnect him from that in a way, if you know what I mean, because yeah, yeah. he's done so many films where he, he you know, essentially he's John McClane. Um, but the quiet moments, I think, were the bits, the first 25 minutes or so of this film I quite liked because it did feel like it was quite up to date, but at the same time, had the elements of the old thing mm-hmm. as a, the audience, you felt aggrieved on his behalf. He was a guy who basically would repair sort of gang bangers in trauma. And some would say, Hey, you're going to help the guy who just shot me. And he's like, yeah, everyone get essentially he's a proper doctor. You know, everyone gets treatment. Yeah. Um, and you knew that was going to change. And I found that really interesting. And he does, you know, he gets to do his, you know, this is still the guy who was in 12 monkeys and Pulp Fiction. So, in the bits where he's grieving and he's going to the counselor and stuff and he's being very quiet and still, I thought he was really good. And then I don't know for me, the film, once he actually got into kind of death wish mode, I'm not sure what film this film wanted to be. Mm. It, it tonally, it felt really, really all over the place for me. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. To separate him from, his previous roles. I almost wish he'd cast an unknown or someone. I, I do you know what I wish, and this is without sounding like I'm trying to kind of be super progressive. I think it would be a more interesting film if their Willis and Elizabeth Shue roles were reversed. Mm. Well, and if it's something that happened to him and she'd been the one that ended up going like that. Perhaps, Pete, you could watch with me that in future the film Peppermint starring Jennifer Garner. Ah. 
she is an ordinary housewife whose family are either killed or uh, attacked and nothing is being done. So she disappears for a couple of years and basically goes off to become a harder bass training on everything, comes back, goes after them. And then everybody is then watching and people are on her side because they know who she is and know what's going on and social media is involved and filming and all this kind of thing. So I don't know when that's coming out, but it's been filmed and there's a trailer coming out uh, for it if it's not already out. So that's one to watch. Okay. So there you go. Oh, uh, um, hmm. Trying to see when it came out. Um, Don't know. It says 2018. That's what it says. It came out last year, but... I've not seen it uh, release date over here or America it came out in September. There you go. Okay. Mm, I've not seen it. I've got it UK. does. Yeah. It does. Just reading the, the descriptions. It seems like it's, it's uh, well, this is why hard to kill where she comes out of a coma. Yeah. Anyway. Yes. So you would have preferred to see this kind of spun. Around well, maybe I'm not, and they're not, not, you know, again, not because it's like this. You know, I do think there should be more good roles for women, but it's not just because that. It's just because it's something we haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah. Seeing Bruce Willis being avenged is not something we've seen before. Um, <laughs> yeah, Peppermint is described as the female John Wick. Mm, perhaps, mm, but it doesn't appear to have a UK release date. Not yet, so. not yet. But it's one to to keep an eye out for. Maybe on like a download or a. You know, a Netflix it'll pop up or something. He doesn't become the machine. He doesn't become this kind of super killing thing. I like the fact, I like that. The fact that the first time he goes out, uh, he, he's just walking past and he sees this woman being harassed by two guys and he goes, hey, stop that. And she runs off and he doesn't know what to do and they basically just kick the crap out of him. He doesn't then go off and learn karate and train with guns every night and become a marksman and go out. He doesn't. He's just kind of. He's still bumbling around and he ends up with a gun by accident. And then he does what anyone else would do. He's on YouTube watching videos on like how to clean yeah. your gun. Yeah, that is true. This. I'm like, oh, yeah. And then And I think I think it's the weird thing of having a film like this that's that's made and set now. Yeah. Because it is so different. It just it, so the the first bit that took me out of the film was where he's watching like this video about how to about places to buy guns and it felt like a parody. Yeah. But then I remembered I'm not American. And I don't live in America. <laughs> and I don't may and I don't I couldn't I was I all through this film I'm trying to work out is the filmmaker doing like the seventies thing of like yes, let's root for this guy. Or is he trying to spin it in another way about gun culture? I don't think the ending makes it about gun culture, but it feels almost like he's trying to go that way. So it's quite over the top. And then when he goes to buy the gun from the like attractive woman selling guns, it yep. all feels a bit like a gun fetish culture thing. But then it does also feel like something you'd see on the news mm-hmm. now. So it does feel more like... Um, yeah, I guess it just feels over the top, but then I guess that's just the reality uh, in some places. Um, I thought the way he got the gun was a little bit contrived, but um, but maybe it's just because it happened so quickly. As soon as he thought he was going to, you know, he started watching the videos and the next day someone dropped a gun, mm. whereas maybe it should have been a bit more of a gap between that. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I didn't, I, when he first started killing, I thought this just feels like a real stretch for this guy to be doing this. But then they did sort of show him with remorse and kind of... Well, he hurt his hand the first time he did it, yeah. remember? Because yeah, he yeah. said, oh, there's someone who's not shot a gun before. And it, it, it kind of jumps back on his hand and cuts it. And someone... There's that weird thing again. That you think it's very much set in now because when he first goes out and does it, someone's oh, filming him through a window and they film the whole thing. And when the cops come to talk to the person, they sort of say, you know... We would we'd appreciate if you didn't release this. And the girl's like, "It's already out on YouTube. I'm getting hits like crazy." And I'm like, "Oh, okay." So there again, it feels like that's a kind of commentary yeah, yeah. on social media and people wanting to get known for things. And then you had like serious radio talking about him all the way through, which is another kind of weird aspect. Um, I st- it felt a very 21st century film in some ways. Yeah, but it was very. As you said, it felt quite jumbled at times. There wasn't yeah. a clear, distinct mood to the film. No, and like, and the the police were almost comic relief. They were when they took him with the, their boss. The, 
It was almost like um, Keystone Cops. It was just the strangest thing. It felt like they just basically got, they'd almost gone like, I know you're supposed to be filming this other film over here, like which is like a Judd Apatow film <laughs> that's, you know, about these comedy bumbling cops. You couldn't just pop in and do a few scenes just to pad this out for us. It just, it felt really, you know, give me a bear claw. It just felt really, really odd in a film with so with someone essentially, you know, killing people in the street. With, without looking it up, can you tell me the name of the two cops' boss who pops in for one scene to chew them out and and then kind of walks off, having told them to do their job better? Can you? He's a very famous actor. We've seen him in lots of things. He's in lots of action films. He's not Sven Arnold Thornton. Um, <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> he's in lots uh, of TV shows. He's been in X Files. He's in. Um, I'm trying to think what else I've seen him in recently. Oh, it's not. Um... Go on. It's Stephen McCarty. I don't know who that is. I do. I do, I do. know who he is. He was in Watchmen. He was, he was in Orphan Black. He was, he was in The Strain. He was in Twelve. Oh, okay. Movies. Yes, 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 yes. He's in everything. Absolutely everything you can think of. He's been in it. Really, seriously. He's in Haven as Driscoll, and yeah. Yeah, brilliant, yeah, Steve McCatty. Love him, love him, love him, love him. It turns up, tells them they're they're losers. But there again, you said like the comedy thing. The guy's going, you know, well, we've got this, and we're, we're narrowed it down. <laughs> and the boss just stares at them like, "Are you fucking kidding me? Really?" So, as you say, the tone shifts. Maybe they're just trying to make light of some of the more serious scenes, but it 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 was really off balance for me. Yeah, and some films can do it, and maybe it's just there's a bit later actually where uh, Bruce Willis delivers a line which feels like it's come from a completely different film. What's that? And there's well, there's a few Looney Tunes moments in it. There's a bit where the bowling ball falls on the guy's head, mm. and yeah. there's the bit where he says, "Are you, you going to kill me?" No, oh, Jack yeah. is. No, so Jack is. Then drops a car on him. It's like, yeah. guys, this is not you know Mr. Freeze. This is yeah, um, not Batman and Robin. It's like, what, what are you doing? It's, it's, it does. I don't, I don't, I, I, I've, a film hasn't made me scratch my head as much as this in a long time because right, I was like, right. every sort of 10 minutes ago, yeah, I get this film. Now I know what I'm watching. <laughs> oh, no, hang on. What, why, why are you making one liners? Aren't you the guy who was the surgeon who's the. And it just, I don't know. I just, and there's things like, and I just didn't buy, like, he kills a guy called the Ice Cream Man. He's a drug dealer yes. telling. Yeah. But he just he actually just finds out about it, just walks over in the I appreciate he's you know, he's trying to be like he's back in unbreakable with his hoodie up all the time. Yep. Uh, or being Luke Cage. But like it's broad daylight. And he's a, the only white man in a yeah. predominantly black yeah. neighborhood that is and seriously looks, a, not a good area from, from the way yeah. it's been the set's decorated. And he looks just like Bruce Willis. <laughs> We're gonna know. Okay, if you if you didn't know it was Bruce Willis, and Bruce Willis wasn't you know a, a known actor, and you had to yeah. describe him, you'd say average height, white, bald, bald head. Any any yeah. any interesting features? No. no. Eye color? Not really sure. Anything else about him? Any tattoos? I think no. No. Yeah. Got a bit of a that, smirk, and that's it. You're like I, I've now run yeah. out of things to describe him. Who does he look like? Yeah. I don't know. Bruce no Willis. one. <laughs> because you know it's, he's not so no, in some true. ways you can kind of understand it but equally you, yeah you could eat because um uh dean norris playing the the cop doesn't look that dissimilar to him <laughs> slightly more overweight uh <laughs> <laughs> looks like know. i from breaking bad maybe maybe yeah um... that's true that's true <laughs> so one one thing that i did Probably. quite like yeah. was that the fact that he goes to the therapist after he's dying and killing people. And they're like, how are you doing? He's like, I'm great. I'm fine. I feel so much better. And it's almost like the, the next stage of grief is revenge. No, he'd, which, start, he'd start seeing her before. Yeah, no, but I'm saying is that he, when he'd been going before, oh, he'd right, been yeah, like, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't, I can't, I can't eat, sleep, I can't sleep. I can't do this. And then he's like, yeah, I'm absolutely brilliant. Yeah, great. I'm having <laughs> a great time. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. It's like, yeah. oh. So, yeah, that was, so we, that was getting... So, Bit of cheese, bit of uh, bit of edam in the room there. I could smell it. She's an accessory, I think that means. Mm. Uh, but also, did you know at that point as well? Because, and again, whether it's just for modern audiences, because oh, we can't really follow this guy that's killing everybody. That's a bit bad. Let's follow the. So we start following the police for about twenty minutes. 
<laughs> and I don't know, really know why. But they, but they, like, they made a few jokes. They were, they were, they came across that they were really going to be helpful. Then they came across that they didn't really give a shit. Yeah. And then they came across that they're incompetent. Yes. And then suddenly we were following them, trying to work out who it was. Um, there's one thing, and I don't know if this was deliberate or whether it's just me projecting. Uh, but did you think that Vincent D'Onofrio was in on the crime? Yes. Yes. So there again, they've set that up again. Like they, they do this thing where they go to. So he's got problems with money. So at that yep. point, you're thinking, oh, because he says his brother says uh, we should say that Vincent Joffrey's character is playing the brother of Bruce Willis's character. And at one point, they've been out to dinner somewhere, and he's kind of hanging around, and and Bruce Willis looks at him and says, "How much do you need?" And he's like, "No, uh, yeah, just two grand." And you're thinking, right, he's got problems with money, yeah, yeah. he's maybe gambling, he's not doing, you know, he's a dodgy guy, blah, blah, blah. And that, they set and that the, up. He, yeah, and he's the guy who kind of, I think, sends him over the car, the valet guy over to the car, who then gets the details to rob the house. I think they are, because in lots of other films, that would have been the story. Yeah, and plus Vincent uh, Jonathan is known for playing villains. Yeah. So that's what they, they think. you think it's going. Then yeah. they do the thing where um, the cops start looking for someone, and yet Somehow they come to him, find him like bat- um, playing um, baseball practice, you know, in a batting thing. Yep. And they talk to him like he's a potential suspect. And it's like, what? So has he got a dodgy background? And then I think, yeah, I think this because he's got a criminal record. I think he was the closest person to the what happened that has a criminal record. Yeah. And then they set up that thing where you think he's going to do something, and then he gives the money back to his brother. So and he got because he lost his job. It wasn't a gambling thing, and blah blah blah. And he's back on his feet. And then even then, they you still kind of think that they're they're, they're angling it that way. So you find out maybe he had a massive grudge against his brother for some reason. Yeah, and he's yeah. the boss behind all of the people, but he's not. No, he's just a nice, he's just a nice brother that happened to be on difficult times. I think they've almost like you say deliberately cast to make you think that. Yeah. Because it was around the scenes where he's kind of being really comforting that I kind of looked away and was making notes. And I hadn't really thought of him being Kingpin mm. in uh, Daredevil until then, but I just heard him say something and like suddenly clicked into his voice. I mean, it's different because he does a very kind of like staccato delivery almost yes. as Kingpin. I suddenly was like, oh, he's being really genuine, but he sounds like Kingpin. Um, but yeah, I think they, they, I was really, I'm glad that you said it as well because I thought if I just misread this, no, but I think no. they were, they, they, they were in there, yeah, to make it seem like he's dodgy and to make you think something else is going on, and yeah, they they set it up that way. I think I mean how he finds out, how he finds the people who actually did it because at first we should have said I guess is he's which I'd forgotten from the original Death Wish he isn't. It isn't just revenge for what happened. It's just kind of like, well, a bit like falling down. It's like, well, hang on, look at this broken world. Yeah. There's police getting shot. There's people getting away with stuff. My family. Actually, who's doing anything about it? The police are, are not doing anything. They're drowning so I'll take in the, cases. Yeah. So I'll do it. I'll take it. Lord. So he starts, he's, people he's killing it. Anyone he sees doing wrongdoing, I guess. Yeah. But then, I mean, I thought this was a bit, when a guy's brought into the trauma room, and he looks dodgy, and I think he's got a tattoo that he recognises, and then he happens, he gets his phone, he checks his phone, which has then got a picture of the he's got his watch of his on. address. He's wearing his watch. Is that what it is? Yeah, okay. So he, and yeah, because they, they, yeah, they mention the watch a lot at the start, and it's kind of a... Yeah, it's a special it's watch, it's a birthday thing, he's called Miguel, he's got MJ on his arm, He um, doesn't he die on the table? Yes, because they, they go to yeah, resuscitate and he dies, and then he goes back in uh, when they've covered him up, gets his watch back, goes into personal belongings and steals the guy's phone. So he knows at some point the yeah. guy stole his watch. And the only way he could have done that is that if he broke into the house and therefore on the phone he finds stuff, contacts, and a picture that the guy had taken of his address. So we know that he's involved, and now that he's got his phone, he can work out who some of his contacts are, and some of them were probably involved. So, yeah, and then there's like a photo of the chop of the... Uh, the shop, which is where he goes to next to find the next person. Yeah. So it's there's a bit yeah. simple logic to it, but it, it is very, very tenuous. Yeah, but I guess I suppose you know they live in a I don't know, small neighborhood, but I guess it's near enough to the place where 
this uh, restaurant was that the valley was at, I suppose, because he uses that, doesn't he? He kind of pretend he goes into this strange bar. Is it a bar? A bowl which has got it's like a bar and a thingy shop, a pawn shop. Yeah, which people watching uh, boxing or something, or no, it's a lady in a g-string, bo- uh, ten pin bowling. <laughs> <laughs> Because I thought I really it's like topless darts. It's like it's like it's like topless darts back in the day. Um, I was just thinking because it just kept being shown. I was thinking this is a very strange niche place that they're at. It is. Um, so he goes there, pretends he's in the restaurant, but it's kind of blatantly obvious he's not. The guy rings fish, not from Marillion, but um, the guy who's behind this. Um, and yeah, and he fights. And he so see the second guy that he drops the with a bowling ball. Yeah, they land just. It's just it felt like a Looney Tunes cartoon. It's just like, I don't know, again, tonally, it just felt really weird. I think really what they were supposed to show by that was that he's not a professional, it's all down to luck, it's purely random, and he only escaped because of the bumbling arounds of the other guy, not because he's a great super killer like Bruce Willis normally is in a film. So it's supposed to show that he's the everyman, that, ooh, it was pure chance and he could have died at any moment and to raise the risks, but you know in this kind of film, yeah. one is going to win <laughs> and two, he's not going to die. I think when you knock a shelf and a bowling ball rolls along and lands on someone's head, the only thing trap. missing is, is, is stars. It is. It's like all, it's, <laughs> all you need is stars around his head. It's, it's a very 80s thing to do in a film. Yeah, but, but if the whole film was him saying no Jack is and that happening, it would be more like an Arnie film. Yeah, if, he, if like, that tr- ball, bowling ball yeah. had hit the guy in the head and he'd said, strike, then, you know, yeah. or, ooh, I need a spare. Some Something... <laughs> <laughs> should write the second one yeah then uh you know th- then that would have been consistent but yeah. it didn't do that so no it was um yeah it was just it was just odd for me because and i put a note here it's like you know one minute it's playing it super straight then it's got this bowling ball thing then it's on the, the new cycle and him being called the grim reaper i don't yeah. think he was called the grim reaper in the original yeah, and there's a copycat, which I thought was quite interesting. There was a copycat person that died. Gets killed that, straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Guy goes out in a hoodie, sees someone being mugged. Guy has a gun, shoots the copycat dead, finished. And you're like, oh, there again, it's supposed to show that he's not invincible and he's not super strong or special in any way. That's what they're trying to do with that. And, you know, yes, it could happen, all that kind of stuff. But I don't know, it just. They're throwing a lot of stuff at the wall social yeah. media and the radio and copycats and the, the the police it almost feels like they could have stripped down the script and made it leaner and less silly and it would have worked better and plus they could have then got a consistent tone um i think clarity that's it so when i'm when i'm yeah. working on a book or something and i get edits back it's about stripping stuff out or tightening things yeah. to make it consistent so you have clarity of story and i think that's what was missing from this film yeah i think when we obviously because we both write when we're watching that something that's good yeah that, that's going to get a higher score i'm not you know not giving anything away but um you we forget that the writer in in me certainly turns off yeah switches yeah. off because you you're going on along. Like, where, Whereas with this, I was thinking, oh, what? You know, hang on, so let me pause it a second. Why have they made that decision? What's? And I don't know, like you say, they've thrown so much at it. It feels that like either they just never had confidence and threw stuff in it anyway, mm. or they had a film which just didn't have an, enough to it, and yeah. they've added loads of stuff on instead, and like um, gone for kind of volume of things rather than. Um, yeah, I, 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 I still don't know what I think about this film, to be honest. But I guess that the. the this is where things shift a bit, isn't it? Because Knox, who's the main bad guy, yep. um, he tries to kind of wrestle control back from Hershey now. Because up to now, I guess, Hershey's kind of managed to bumble his way through killing the right people. Mm-hmm. And this, he's, he's the kind of main person. But he lures him to a club, doesn't he? he yeah, um, yeah, so this he, guy says to phones up Paul Kersey and says... Or no, he rings him and he doesn't answer. And then he texts him and says... I know who you are, I know what you've done, you know, turn up at this club or else I'll tell everybody. Um, so he, he walks into the trap, basically, and it goes badly wrong and he gets shot and there's people all in the club getting shot and killed and he uses someone like a, a body as a screen at one point, not on purpose, yeah, yeah. like someone stumbles in front of him and they get killed instead of Paul. 
uh, Bruce Willis he did character, so. it was quite weird because I just thought at this stage yeah okay he wants this guy dead but it felt like his his daughter wasn't awake I don't think at this point but nope. um but she's she's showing I think better signs and and he started to think that the police might be on to him but he shows no real fear of getting caught no which I could which I could understand if his wife and daughter were both dead yep. nothing to lose yeah but he has still got someone who's alive and who's relying on him and also there's a scene in the club I think it's in the toilet that he suddenly is very good with a gun mm. um, I guess you know practice makes perfect well we still um, have but, seen him practicing through the film but yeah. even so it's still a bit kind of he's like yeah led on the floor through the stalls of a thing he's kind of managing to hit people quite you know and while he's being shot yeah yeah. But I, again, no, hey, it's. It, but that's the thing. Like, I could buy that if I bought into the tone of the film. Mm-hmm. If I'd gone, okay, this is all super heightened. Like John Wick is heightened as anything. Yeah, um, the Equalizer is, mu- is much more grounded. I think that's the, the the trouble with this film in some ways is that it's come out now, and not even five years ago, yeah. where there's so many other things of a similar ilk that are doing something that works really well for yeah. now anyway yeah. so is this bit quite interesting because his, his, his daughter's awake she doesn't know the mum is dead which is pretty um grim yeah. um and then the police are at the hospital but the killer is in the elevator Knox is in the elevator with him isn't he pretending to be a patient well he was a, here's the irony he was he was a patient oh, he, and he, was, a, he claims to awesome. be a witness and tells them about what yeah, was happening yeah. at the club the police then go after Paul Kersey because they know that he's involved, but they can't prove it. And plus, he's a very, very rich, remember, trauma surgeon who has a lot of money. So the cops say, we'll only go for him properly when we're absolutely sure yes. that we can get him. So they can't, even though they, they this guy has said it, they've got no evidence, they've got no DNA or, or proof of anything that he was there. Although, to be fair, if he was shot in the club, there's blood, and therefore yeah. you could probably get... Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But this, yeah, you kind of have to blur, go past some things and just go with yeah. it. Uh, so he goes home. Yep. And kind of just is the guy going after him at home because he doesn't want him to know who he is, or is he getting revenge for his friends? I think he already or knows. Is he that just? They know who is he, he just? Is he just pissed off with him? Pissed off with him. Wants to finish. Get rid of him. And I think he just, you know, it's the fact that he's killed his friends. But okay. Bruce Willis' character knows, I think he recognised him in the Yeah, list. I think so. He knew this guy was going to come after him. He knew something was going on because we've seen him walk into that shop again and say, hello, I'd like to buy a gun. Uh, and talk yeah, which is, this girl. is the bit, actually, the bit. this is the one bit of the story I thought was very clever. Mm. Because I was like, well, why is he buying a gun? He's already bought, he's already found a gun and then somehow got more guns. So why is he going there? But then you suddenly start thinking, hang on, what did they say at the start? Okay, she can fill out a registration form for him really quickly. She can, and also, I'm sort of jumping ahead, but it kind of, it gives him, in a way, it gives him an alibi. Yeah. Because it's a new gun he's just bought. And if you're attacked in your own home. Yeah, he killed, killed an intruder. Yeah. It's understandable. Yeah, so that yeah, it's not it's not well we are spoiling the whole thing. Basically the guy breaks in with two of his mates armed with massive machine guns. Yeah. And Bruce Willis puts them down very hard. Oh, the guy down the stairs. I cringed when his Oh, that was gross. That was pretty He kinda plan he kinda set it up as a trap almost, didn't he, for yeah. knowing they were coming. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. But yeah, and he kills them all. Um yeah, and then, of course, the cops say, oh, where did you get the gun? Well, I just purchased it just the other day. And, yes, I have a license for all these weapons from Jolly Rogers. You can look them up. And, like, the fact it's called Jolly Rogers just makes me cringe. But no again, maybe, maybe that's just us. Maybe there are places like that called Jolly that's Roger the, yeah. Guns. Yeah. I don't know. But it's just, I was saying about the commentary on gold culture, there's that thing where she says, oh, don't worry, there's hardly anything you have to do to get a gun. You can have it in no time. It's like, hang on. So that's kind of poking yeah. fun at Blakely. You can get any kind of fucking machine gun in five minutes and there are no checks. So that someone who's made the film is commenting on that. Someone yeah, yeah. is. There. It's not. You can't pretend otherwise. No, and that's but that's why, in a way, I thought it would have a different ending. Yeah. But because it kind of essentially ends with 
the policeman kind of going, well, how did you hurt your hand? He's like, oh, I just happened today. And he's like, really, really? And your okay. shoulder, that your hand that's yeah, being yeah. healed, wink, wink. And, and he literally shoulder, is, wink, I, wink. I'd written here, I officially put here, the police are okay with it, wink, wink. Yeah. And it is very like, oh, well, seeing as it's you, we'll <laughs> say no more. Let's just get away with the warning. And you kind of think, okay. But then I was like, okay, so what are the filmmakers trying to tell me? Because they've kind of pushed the the, the anti-gun message because of everything that's happened in America, which I, which I totally understand. But they're also still making this film, which is very much in that kind of exploitative space. And at the end, he's kind of a hero and he got away with it and it's kind of okay. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to think or feel. But the very end is really cr- weird as well. Like, so it was in the trailer, which, which always kind of baffled me. So at the very, very end of the film, the daughter goes off to college and he's fine and all the rest of it. And he sees some guy walking across the street and the guy steals a bag and Bruce Willis shouts out, yo, hey, stop that. And the guy stops and looks and goes, what? And he points his finger at him, pretends it, Bruce Willis points his finger at him and pretends it's a gun and kind of goes bang, bang. And you're like, so what, is, what does that mean? Is it not over? Because the whole thing with that cop, is, he talks that through with the cop saying, oh, did you have a Glock? He goes, no. Yes, but I don't need it anymore. Are you sure? Yes, I don't have the Glock anymore. It's that part of my life is over. Okay, then, good. And then, the, then this bit at the end, you're like, so, so what? Is he now addicted to it? Does he enjoy killing too much that he can't give it up? Is it he's just become a hard ass? Like you say, you, I don't need to be led around by the nose in a film in order to know what to feel or how to feel. I don't like that. You make up your own mind. No. But because no. this film is so jumbled, you get to the end and you go, what? I, I know what I watched, but I don't really know what it's trying to tell me because yeah. I don't think it's very clear in itself. Maybe it was scripts. Maybe it was editing. Maybe it was revisions of the script. I, I just don't know. It is weird. And I, you know, if I think, and also if the action was at the level of an equalizer or John Wick, mm. some of the other things would maybe have melted away. Yeah. But because so there are some there are some really strong scenes in this film. Yeah. But they are they do feel like it does it. It's nowhere near as good as the first fifteen minutes for me. And the first fifteen minutes, it felt like it was building up to being something mm. as good as those two films for me personally, because you know I like the setup. But then it just yeah. Yeah, I just want to point out something quite fun right from IMDb. Do you know who my favourite character is? And uh, two actually favourite characters in the whole of this film. No. Okay, so one of them, the uh, the the part, the actor got this on on the script is called belligerent dad. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where right at the beginning in that first fifteen minutes, where he's at the football game or soccer. Oh yeah, yeah, soccer, yeah. That is a great. If you're that's, American, that's, of course. See, that's soccer. a good scene. That's a good scene. Yeah. Yeah, so there's this belligerent dad guy who's having a go at him and basically kind of trying to lure him into a fight because he's swearing, played by the wonderful actor Andreas Apurgis, who I've seen in things before. So, <laughs> just a bit of an aside, but it's related. I listened to a podcast with um, Stephen Tobolowsky, who's been in the acting business for a long time. He's been in everything, everything from Groundhog Day upwards, you know, so many things. And he does this podcast, he talks about being in Hollywood. And he says, when you get a script, there's different levels to the part that you have. There's a part that has two names. So, John Smith, Paul Kersey, whatever. The next lift ne- down is a job title and a name. So it'd be like Detective Johnson or, you know, whatever, a Barry the Plumber or something yeah. like this. And then there's the next version down, which is something like this belligerent dad <laughs> yeah well ian ian matthews next on the cast is ian matthews who plays ponytail yeah that was my other favorite part <laughs> the only thing worse than this next level down is cop number three or yeah. you know dad number two or something like that that's the next there's, level down there, there's there are some great ones in this film actually there's yep. squeegee man SpongeBob, <laughs> sponge bath nurse yes uh witness yep and Greenwich Thief. Yes, yeah, so you've got like Nurse Judy. You know, that, that, <laughs> that's that's a certain level. Nurse Audrey. And then you just get like Paramedic 1, Paramedic there's, 2. There's another two more. Tight dressed woman and well dressed man. Punk 2. You see, that's that's the next level <laughs> yeah. down. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I just love the fact that it's uh, belligerent dad. So, so, get, so, so get, how, do I get, yeah. how do I get into my role? Well, you're a belligerent dad. But then oh, even further down than that, you've got like. Funeral attendant, uncredited. Pedestrian, <laughs> uncredited. That's Good even further down. uncredited. That's, that's basically harsh. extra. That's basically a slight that's step cool. above an extra. That's what that is. Yeah. 
It's like, okay, so what do I get to do? Well, we're not going to actually credit you, but this is what you... Anyway, that's an aside, but that's fun. <laughs> I love it, love it. Belligerent Dad, I'm going to be... I want to be that in the film. If they ever make a film about me... Yep. Yeah, that's you. That'll... Yep. <laughs> Belligerent Dad. <laughs> but it is funny. It would have been a funnier ending if it ended up punching him. Mm. Yeah, if she was playing soccer again, and this time the man's there, and he just punches him out. That that would at least made uh, consistent in some ways yeah. that he's gone on a journey. Whereas this, you don't know. Has he gone on a journey? Has he? Has he not? Has he? Is he learned his lesson? Is he done? <sighs> Are we ready for some scores? I think we. I think there's anything left to say. <laughs> Other than that, yeah. You're a funny guy. Enough with the yak at the yak. What is your score? Okay. Do you want to go first? Because I've just been talking. Oh, okay. So this was your choice, I believe. It was. Um, oh, yes. Well, neither of us have seen it before. No. Nope. So it's good to see Bruce Willis in a in a slightly better role. Uh, we've kind of said all it already, I suppose. But it was it was three or four films welded together, and I think Bruce Willis was in two different films at once. <laughs> the sort of, but then I guess that you know the quiet, sensitive, twelve monkeys Bruce Willis, and the kind of you know the smirky Bruce Willis that's in lots of other things, and it just uh, it had promise. But it just kind of, it fell apart, I thought, completely, really. And then it just became a bit kind of, like I say, if we're going to talk about this kind of genre of film and Taken and Equalizer and John Wick, this is a long way off of those, yep. which is a shame because I think the cast is, it's not, it was a an acting cast, if you know what I mean. It was, oh, yeah. it was people that, that have all got the chops, but the drama wasn't that strong and the action scenes were were okay, but it kind of, I don't know, there's nothing to elevate it really, and I'm battling between because we don't do half bags. I'm struggling not. because I don't know. I'm going to be generous then, I think, and I'm going to give it two bags. Wow, wow, okay, okay, yeah, a jumbled film, a bit of a mess. As as you know, I'm not really in favour of remakes. There are a billion other new stories out there, so but hey, they've gone back to the well on this one. I don't think it's done well enough to warrant any more but then again you know with downloads and digital things and and you know that kind of thing you never know bruce willis can do some really good things we, we've seen him in in some great films and and he, he's got one coming up of course uh glass that looks going back to the well with you know that he started on unbreakable so that could be brilliant i'm look, oh, looking at the stats um the budget for this film was 30 million dollars it only okay. grossed thirty-four million in the US, and there was nothing well, uh, nothing foreign. So perhaps it went straight to Netflix. It wasn't released outside of uh, the US, which isn't a good sign because we watched it on Netflix. We did. I mean, you know, we know films on Netflix can be good, but if they're sent there as opposed to they originate there, that's not always a good thing. And this looks like it's probably lost money because they say take the budget and double it and add a bit more, and you have to clear that before you make a profit. So it doesn't look like it's made a profit. So yeah, there's been no talk of a sequel, which I think would be the sign if it had done it had done well. Yeah. So based on all of that and and everything we said so far, I'm only going to give it two bags as well because it seems that seems quite harsh. But you know, a three bag film is still very very solid, and this was quite problematic in some ways. It was inconsistent and it was is jumbled. So yeah, two bags. It's it's all right to have in the background if you've got nothing else to watch, which is not true these days. But if you want to take a look, you know, go in with knowing all of that. I think that's I think that's fair. Okay, Pete, wrap us up. Thank you for listening. If indeed you still are. Good night. Good night. You have been listening to Bags of Action. No bullshit. You'd better stick around for the next episode. Because if you're lying, I'll be back.